So let's continue up the overtone series. How many hertz is the third overtone of an A at 110 hertz? So 110 times 4. 440. 440. 440 hertz. And what note is that? An A. Another A. Two octaves from the fundamental, from the note we are playing. Let's move on to the fourth overtone and see what we find. For our fourth overtone, our string is vibrating in five equal parts now. So 110 times five. How many hertz is that? 550. 550. So we have the string vibrating as a whole at 110 hertz in two halves at 220 hertz. Of course, much quieter than the fundamental vibration in three parts at 330 hertz, in four at 440, and now in five vibrating at 550 hertz, giving us five minuscule C sharps. That's a C sharp. So what this means is that when we hear an A, other than just hearing more A and a little E, we are also hearing a little bit of C sharp too. This means that C sharp is important to A in music, just as E is, but not quite as much. So we find a new interval between A and C sharp. You already know how one part of this interval will be called. This isn't a fifth, but A... It'll be a third. A third. We have three letters moving from A to C sharp. This third is a major third. This interval is no longer perfect. The A and C sharp sound harmonious when played together, but sound more like two separate notes than A and E. A and E, C sharp and E. So A and C sharp are not a perfect pair. They can't disappear into one another, but they are a major pair. They're good together. When we play these three notes together, A, C sharp and E, or rather when we play the perfect fifth, A to E, and the major third, A to C sharp together, we have what we call a major chord. This chord is A major because its constituent notes were born from A. We are building the chord from A and the first two different notes that appear in its overtone series. So there are all different types of chords in music and the major is the main standard one. It's standard because it's built from what is already happening in the notes overtone series. When we play the major chord, we are just bringing a notes overtones out and in turn, giving them their own overtones when we play them as notes. All of that math dances harmoniously in the air, which gives the major chords a strong, stable, certain quality. So chord is what we call it when we play notes at the same time. Curiously, chord, C-H-O-R-D, as used in music, comes from the meaning of chord, C-O-R-D, like string, although they're spelt differently. The notes of the A major chord are the very same one sounding within the string, within the note, at the same time as the fundamental note is played. We bring those notes out of the string by playing them as their own separate notes with their own overtones, and now we have various strings intertwined. We have a chord. When we say in accordance with, in English, the chord of accordance means to agree. In accordance with, in agreement with, as in the Spanish d'accordo or the French d'accord, meaning agreed, okay. In Greek, when we want to say I agree, we say symphono, like symphony. I symphonize. Symphony means something like with voices, many voices. Those voices, plural, are the harmonics. So this mathematical agreement is so audible in the air that it has become part of our languages in all different ways. A, C sharp and E agree with each other because of their maths and because our minds understand them as having originated from A. As our brains already understand what overtones are, even though we might not have until recently. Our brains use overtones to differentiate different sounds. So imagine you're in the supermarket and you're hearing a, an announcement, the checkout beeps, your telephone, some music, maybe some publicity at a stand all at once. Your brain's able to differentiate between all those sounds. And what helps your brain do that is the overtone series. It's not looking for one number, but a series of numbers. 
Our brains are so good at sussing out overtones that we could even change the order of the notes in a chord. We might have C sharp or E as the lowest note in A major, for example, instead of A. And our brains can still recognize that this is A major, that C sharp and E relate back to A rather than A and E relating to C sharp, for example. A is the boss here. A birthed the other two notes and our minds, already expert at detecting overtones and where they came from, know this. In fact, we could even leave out the A altogether and our brains will hear an A major chord. Our reality seems to be a mix of what we perceive and what we expect to perceive and music confirms this. So we really can begin to appreciate how these overtones really are a part of our hard wiring. And so the major chord being a result of the first notes to appear together in the overtone series was the most natural and thus first chord humans were likely to arrive at. And from there, folk experimented. So what happens if we lower the perfect fifth a little? A, C sharp, and E. What if we play that with an E flat? Which gives us the diminished fifth instead of the perfect fifth. And we already know how uncomfortable that sounds. Let's leave that for now. What happens if we increase the perfect fifth a little? That doesn't sound great either, no? What if we lower the major third? Oh, that makes more sense, no? And so this one's stuck. So apart from the very natural A major chord, we also have what we call A minor. We get this by lowering the major third a half note. How might you describe that difference in sound, in feeling? Do you feel any difference between here and that? And this? Sadder. This one? Yeah. Yeah, no? A bit more... Oh, worrying. Mel complicated. No? You were about to say melancholic? Yeah. Yeah, could be. No, this will depend on context in music, but we see it's it's kind of, it's complicated. It's not as simple as... No? Which is sourced from the overtone series. So, A to C is harmonious enough, it works. But there's something else going on, no? Something that makes us uncertain. The A minor chord uses C instead of C sharp, so... If speaking of intervals, A to C sharp is a major third, what might A to C be called? A minor third. A minor third, good. So the major third gives us the major chord and the minor third gives us the minor chord. Both contain the perfect fifth, which helps our minds understand what note is the boss. That in the case of A major, for example, that all the other notes are coming from A. So A, C sharp and E is an A major chord. And A, C and E gives us what? A minor chord. A minor chord, or an <laughs> A yeah, minor a chord. Minor. How about C, E and A in that order with C as the lowest note? It's still an A minor chord. Bravo. It's still an A minor chord. It sounds a little different, but as our brains are actively seeking out the mathematical relationships between notes, we still experience this as A minor. Even if A isn't the lowest pitched note, our brains still know the other notes came from A. But why are these intervals and chords called major and minor? Well, this makes much more sense in Spanish, which is closer than English to the Latin that these words came from. So in Spanish, it's mayor and menor, which just means bigger and smaller. The major interval is a half tone higher, wider, larger than the minor one. But mayor also means main in Spanish, as in plaza mayor, the main town square. And of course, the major interval or chord is the main one, as it's the one sourced directly from the overtone series. So where did the minor interval come from? The change in sensation playing the major and minor chord can be described in similar terms to how we contrasted the perfect and diminished fifth. We have what is standard and natural in the perfect fifth. And then what is something else? 
But why is the minor third not called a diminished third then? The sensation the minor interval gives us is nowhere near as extreme as with the diminished fifth. This is the minor interval, the minor third, and here's the diminished fifth. We can hear much more dissonance in the diminished fifth. So the diminished fifth was the perfect fifth reduced by half a note in the same way that we reduced the A major half a note to get A minor. So the sensation the minor interval gives us is nowhere near as extreme as with the diminished fifth because unlike the diminished fifth, the minor third did not descend from perfection but from a major third. But not only that, the minor third is in fact something important and harmonious in its own right. If we continue looking at the overtones, we'll find what that is. So, we've got as far as the fourth overtone. The fourth overtone of an A at 110 hertz is 550 hertz. That gave us a C sharp. The fifth overtone will be vibrating at how many hertz? 550. That's the fourth overtone. Oh, the fourth overtone, so 660. 660. So it's always like... Uh, One more, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. the first note is just I thought you said it wrong at first. Yeah. <laughs> That's the third. Right, so yeah, the third is 440. So the fourth is 550. And the fifth, sorry? Uh, 660. And what note is 660? Double or half it until it becomes familiar. 330. That was an air. Hmm. If you were to divide 330, if you were to half it, what number would you get? Um, 165. Not an A, right? No. So I'll just go back to the beginning of the overtone series that we're looking at. So we have an A vibrating at 110 hertz. Its second overtone vibrates at... 220. Which is... A. And its third overtone vibrates at... 330. Which is... Also an A. Is it? Is it not? Oh, because we haven't doubled it. Okay. So you know this, but I love that you're working it out again. <laughs> right, so this is, how, this is how we learn. So this is brilliant. I want you to go through this process and working it out again. Okay, so, uh -huh. so forget everything, any numbers or notes or whatever you have floating around in your head, anything that you're holding on to, anything you want to prove or, just, or disprove. Whenever we get ourselves tied in a knot, we can just throw all of that away and start again. So... We have an A at 110 hertz, vibrating, a whole string vibrating. The string vibrates in two parts and vibrates at double that, 220 hertz, giving us another A. And then it's divided in three parts, vibrating at 330 hertz. What note, what relationship did we get appearing now? First we had the octave appearing and then... And then the fifth. And then the perfect fifth. So what is a perfect fifth from A? Um... E. An E. So what note does 660 hertz give us? E. An E. Another E. So two times our E at 330 hertz. So the perfect fifth has appeared again in the overtone series, asserting its importance. So our fourth overtone was a C sharp. And our fifth is an E. The interval between C sharp and an E is... Well, count the letters. We know one part of the name. How many letters from C sharp to E? Three. Three. So we know it's a third. And if I play it together, you can probably tell me if it's a major or a minor third. That sounds a minor. Minor. No, that sounds similar to this sensation that we've gotten. No, rather than this major sensation. Brilliant. So the space between the fourth and the fifth harmonic is a minor third. So whilst this interval is not found between the fundamental frequency and any of its overtones, it is found amongst or within the overtones. This is what justifies the minor chord, if you like, and what makes the minor third a much more acceptable interval than the diminished fifth, for example, the tonos diabolicus, the diabolic tone. The minor interval is still natural, it's just a different perspective on nature. It still alludes to the major interval, but by the time we realise that's not what we're hearing, we have also realised something unexpected. We're actually hearing the interval that occurs between the fourth and the fifth harmonics. 
This is a mechanism used in all types of storytelling. We think we're going one way, and our expectation is violated, but then it's also satisfied in a way that we didn't expect. The minor chord does all of this, but not in a linear way, but in an instant. So let's recap what we've learned going from B this time. Let's choose this B at 60 Hertz. Its first overtone will give us another B, vibrating an octave higher than our fundamental B. At how many Hertz if this B is vibrating at 60 Hertz? 120. 120. And how many Hertz will the second overtone be vibrating at? 180. 180. And what note is this? Do you remember the perfect fifth of B? F. Good. But with B, it was the only note that we can't simply count to find the perfect fifth. There's a small adjustment. F sharp. F sharp. Very good. The next overtone vibrates at 240 Hertz. What note is that? B. Another B, of course. It's four times our original frequency of 60 Hertz. How many Hertz is the fourth overtone vibrating at? Uh, 300. 300. Well, it's actually a little bit more because the original B that we saw a while ago was actually 30.9 Hertz. But we can work with 30 and make the same point, no? So let's say 300 Hertz gives us a D sharp. And so now we know what notes give us a B major chord. Uh, B, F sharp and D. F sharp and D sharp. Very good. Do you want to hear how that sounds? Mm -hmm. Let's play that around the middle of the piano. Let's play it a bit lower. Lower still. So even this is a major chord, starts losing that harmonious quality now, the lower we play it. Because more of those notes overtones are being picked up by the piano and by our ears, and that's starting to sound more complicated, more uncertain, more undeclared. So that's the most common version of the B major chord. B, D sharp and F sharp in ascending order. But as mentioned, we might change the order and our brains would still understand it's a B major chord. So we might play D sharp, B and F sharp in that order. Our brains can still work out that we are working from the perspective of B rather than from D sharp because the important mathematical relationships relate back to B. D sharp is a major third from B and F sharp is a perfect fifth from B. As mentioned, we could even leave the B out and our minds would still understand where D sharp and F sharp came from. That is still a B major. So that's the major chord. What notes does the B minor chord have? What was the major third? in this chord. F sharp. F sharp, B to F sharp gives us the perfect fifth. Perfect fifth, so um, D sharp. So B to D sharp gives us the major third. What will we do to make that a minor third? Take the sharps off. Not take the sharps off, that's a simplification that might cause problems later. We will lower... Lo okay, we'll lower it half a note. We will lower the major interval, half a note. We'll make it a minor interval. So what notes does the B minor chord have? D and F. B, D and F sharp. B, D and F sharp. So, well done. B, D and F sharp give us B minor. And we see how the mood changes instantly. So... This feeling now does sound more complicated, no? Still has this kind of, what's going on? I want to know more about that. Things are not what we see. So it's hard to describe these moods in language, but that's what music's for.